If you would, turn your Bible to 1 Samuel chapter 17. I'm going to share a message today entitled, Facing Giants. Facing Giants. Um, before I get started in the, uh, reading this, the passage and everything, I want to open up with a story today. Um, several years back, I mean, many of you know this already about me, but one thing about me is I'm a, I'm a huge Dallas Cowboys fan, okay? Uh, so there's going to be more smack talk coming later in the season, but I'm a big Cowboys fan. I'm not going to go far off on that, but I need to tell you because I'm setting this sermon up. Uh, not too long ago, well, it was long ago. I feel like it was yesterday. S- several years back, uh, I was at the, I was in Dallas at North Park Mall. Was that it, Sarah? No. We were at North Park, Park Mall in Dallas, and we were eating dinner at a sushi restaurant. And um, I, I've shared this story once b- uh, before, um, but Des Bryant was seated at a table there, and I was wearing, I didn't know that. Des Bryant was a wide receiver for the Cowboys, and I was wearing number 88. Uh, I was wearing his jersey. I was throwing up the X because, you know, it's my boys. I got to represent. And so, Anyways, we're eating sushi, and I began to walk out of the restaurant, and there's this gentleman who turned around, and he said, hey, man, nice jersey. And I was like, hey, thank you, you know. And uh, he looked at me, and he was just, like, looking at me in the eyes, like, making sure, like, you know who I am, you know. And I was like, yeah, man, Des? You know, like, it clicked. I was like, Des Bryant, you know. And then what happened was I started, like, squealing like a girl, and like I couldn't, I couldn't contain myself. I was like, Des Bryant, you know, like, and so Des and I, we talked for just a moment, but honestly, I was too starstruck. I was like, okay, thanks, Des, bye, see you later. I don't know what to do with my hands. And uh, Sarah, Sarah, she came back in there. She's like, you didn't get a picture with Des? And I'm like, no, babe, did you see how big he was? Like, I ain't asking for nothing. Sarah, she's bold. She said, hey, my husband, he's a huge fan of yours. Could you take a picture with him? It would mean the world to him. He's like, yeah. And Sarah's like, hey, Cam, come back in here. And I'm like, uh-uh, uh, okay, all right. So I come back in. First off, here's what happened. Uh, Dez is sitting in this booth, okay? Around Dez are approximately four to five gentlemen that could take my body contort and twist it in such a way and then snap it in two. Um, you know, like th- these, these dudes were huge. And they stood up, the first one stood up and he goes, he looks at me like he's checking me out just to make sure I'm safe. And he stood up and I was like, yeah, yes, sir, <laughs> I'll behave. And then, and then Dez got up and Dez is up and I'm looking up at Dez and I'm like, hey Dez, nice to meet you. I shook his hand. Let me tell you something. That was, the, that was the biggest thing about that moment was when I shook his hand, his hand could have wrapped around my hand three times. That's why he catches the ball, you know. Um, anyways, so I'm sitting there and Des is taking pictures with me. And then the whole restaurant starts to recognize who it is. They're like, oh, it's Des. They start to stand up. And I just got to throw this part out there because I'll, I'll, I'll forever just hold it close to me. Des didn't want to take pictures with anybody else, I guess. So he said, no, 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 this is my homeboy. I'm just taking some photos with his. So I just need you to know that I'm Des Bryant's homeboy, okay? <laughs> I just need you to know. And so I, I, not to name drop or anything, I would never do that. But uh, anyways, so I say that story because I saw this, I saw this giant I saw this, like, on earth, I saw what, like, like if I was going to label a giant on earth, that day, I saw giants among me. I saw men who, who could really hurt me in a very bad way, you know, and they stood up, and, um, you know, I, I just, as I, as I saw them, we see them on TV, and we think, you know, maybe they're, you know, six foot, average size, but then you see them in real, real life, and it's just, a, it's a game changer, you know, like, they were massive. And this morning, I want to tell you that while we may see giants in real life, there are moments in our life every single day that we see spiritual giants that we encounter. There are things that we come about that are giants and mountains, things that are so big. Many of you walk around every day facing things that seem like absolute giants. And truthfully, we all want to say that we have the faith to stand up to our giants, but sometimes, like that moment when I was in the mall, those giants can be intimidating, right? 
Those giants can be intimidating. So for some of you, there's things in your life that are intimidating, some things that you're scared of, some things you don't want to face, some things that you even back down from. And what I want to walk you through today is a story in the Bible, David and Goliath. We know the story very well. I want to approach it from a little bit different angle. And I want you to know today that with the power of God, you can face the giants in your life. Goliath, this man we read of in Scripture, we're going to read about him in just a moment. Goliath was real, real man. He was intimidating. We're going to read all the characteristics of how intimidating he was in a moment. But Goliath was real. And I, I want you to know that even if people around you may not think it, the giants in your life are real. That the things that seem so ginormous and so intimidating in your life, they're real. The question is, can we defeat our giants? Is there life after Goliath? Can, can we walk it? And so some of you this morning, as we talk about the story of David, you're going to begin to compare and you're going to say, well, I'm not David. I'm not that bold. I pray that after today, God would give us a boldness and a courage to move forward and attack the things that try and destroy what God meant for good. The giants that we face today may not be, you know, um, in size or stature. The giants we face today may be unemployment. The giants we face today may be uh, relational issues. The giants we face today may be debt. The giants we face today may be addiction. The giants we face today might, might be sexual immorality. The giants we face today, I don't know what your giant is, but your giant today may not look like a, a Des Bryant or a, you know, or, or a Goliath like we're about to read of, but in your life, it's a giant that's hard to overcome. These giants may seem huge. They may seem impossible. But I'm here to tell you today, God gives us the courage to stand up to our giants, to face giants. So how do we do this? Where do we turn to? The obvious starting point for anything we walk through in life is the Bible, the, the, the authoritative Word of God, the, the Word of God that is living, active, breathing, penetrates the, the heart, it, it penetrates the soul. The Bible, the living Word of God is here, and we get to open it up today, and we get to learn from it. So there's, here's where we're going to draw our message from today is out of 1 Samuel chapter 17. If you can turn your Bibles there. If not, you can watch on the screens. We're going to have the verse up there. In 1 Samuel chapter 17, uh, verse 40 through 51, it says this. It says, then he took his staff in his hand. He chose five smooth stones from the stream. He put them in the pouch of his shepherd's bag. And with his sling in his hand, he approached the Philistine. Verse 41, meanwhile, the Philistine with his shield bearer in front of him kept coming closer to David. He looked David over and saw that he was only a boy, ruddy and handsome, and he despised him. Verse 43, he said to David, am I a dog that you come at me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. In verse 44, come here, he said. And I'll give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. Now, I just want you to know right now, real quick, i got to stop right there. I'll give your flesh. You, you read that part, right? At that moment, that's when I'm out. You know, like if, if that were me, at that moment, I'm running away. Like I, 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 you're, you're going to be, the birds are going to be eating you, you know. The beasts are going to be taking care of you. I'm out, you know. But David held strong. Going on, in verse 45 says, and David said to the Philistine, you come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel whom you have defied. This day, everyone say this day, the Lord will hand you over to me and I'll strike you down and cut off your head. Today I will give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds of the air and the beasts of the earth, and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. Man, David was a bold young man. Verse 47, all those gathered here will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give all of you into our hands. Verse 48, as the Philistine moved closer to attack him, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet him. He didn't run away. He ran toward him. In verse 49, reaching into his bag, he took out a stone. He slung it, and he struck the Philistine on the forehead. The stone sank into his forehead, and he fell face down on the ground. 
So David triumphed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone without a sword in his hand. He struck down the Philistine and killed him. Verse 51, David ran and he stood over him. He took hold of the Philistine's sword and he drew it from the scabbard. After he killed him, he cut off his head with the sword. David was pretty ruthless at that point. But you know what? It was a statement. It was an anthem. It was declaring God's strength that had been given to David and the victory that had taken place that day. So we know this story. We look at this story of David. David faced this giant that no one else wanted to face. He faced this giant that was in his life. And I believe today that as we leave here, just here in a little bit, that after today's message, we will be able to, to stand up and face the giants that run towards us. What does God teach us about giants through David's life? Number one is this. You must choose to face your giant. You must choose to face your giants. 1 Samuel 17, 16, it says, For 40 days the Philistine came forward every morning and evening and took his stand. So for 40 days, the, the Goliath kept coming, and he's looking for somebody to challenge him. Nobody would. And this small young boy named David, Mario, said, You know what? I got this. Hold on a second. I got this. And David came, and he came with a confidence, and we're going to talk more about that in just a minute, but let me say this. If you don't choose to stand up to your giants, if you don't choose to face your giants, your giants will determine your destiny. If you don't choose to face the sin in your life, if you don't choose to face the addiction in your life, if you don't choose to face the depression and the anxiety, if you don't choose to face the things in your life that are impure, the things in your life that are destroying your joy, if you don't choose to face those things, they will determine your destiny. The first thing David had to do was he had to make up his mind that he was going to face his giant, that he was going to, when everyone else was wanting to back down, David said, you know what, I'm going to run up. I'm going to run up. And so the first part of winning any battle is accepting the challenge. If you're going to win the things that you're facing right now, you've got to accept the challenge. And the problem with Christianity today in America is too many of us, whenever our problems come and our circumstances may arise and things may seem like they're going south, too many of us, instead of standing up with a boldness and authority, we run away, we cower down, and we let the enemy have victory. We talked about that a few weeks ago. And I feel like in 2023, God is calling, he's looking for a church, of a, the church of America, the church in the world, the global church. He's looking for us to stand up and begin to face the things that are trying to destroy us. No longer will we take a back seat and be defeated. David did it, this young shepherd boy. I think of the Israelites in Numbers chapter 13. The Lord told Moses to send spies to the land of Canaan. The spies went, you know this story, I'm not going to go into grave detail, but the spies went and they, they, they looked at this land and they came back with a report and it said basically like this land is flowing of milk and honey. Like it's, it's pure, it's gravy, it's gold. Like this is something that's healthy. It's a very rich land. It was great, but... Instead of moving forward into the promised land, instead of moving forward into that land and inheriting that land, they chose to back down because of the people that controlled the land. They chose to back down because of the things that intimidated them, the people that intimidated them. Are you following me this morning? See, the Israelites chose to ignore their giant here. And I just want to say one more time before we move on to the next point is that if you don't choose to face your giants, your giants will control your destiny. If you want to be known as an alcoholic for the rest of your life, it will happen if you don't face it. If you want to be known as somebody who's a, a liar, somebody who's, uh, you know, uh, their, their, their morals are all jacked up, somebody who's half in and half out, someone who's lukewarm, if you don't stand up and face it, it will happen. So the Israelites chose to ignore their giant there. Many of us choose to do the same. But David chose to face his giant. What else can we learn from David? Number two, the odds are against you. The odds are against you. And let me read this, 1 Samuel, 4, or, sorry, 1 Samuel 17, 4 through 7. 
says this, a champion named Goliath who was from Gath came out of the Philistine camp. He was over nine feet tall. So if you're following over nine feet tall, that's just about a foot taller than I am. uh, So you can imagine. (laughs) Did you say double my height? Somebody said double my height. That was a little too much there. A little too much there. Let's go ahead and move to the altar call. (laughs) Prayer team? No, just kidding. So he was over nine feet tall, verse 5. He had a bronze helmet on his head and wore a coat of scale armor of bronze weighing 5,000 shekels. On his legs he wore bronze greaves and a bronze javelin was slung on his back. His spear shaft was like a weaver's rod and its iron point weighed 600 shekels. His shield bearer went ahead of him. So here's Goliath. He towers above them all. He's nine feet, nine inches tall in his his stocking feet, wearing 125 pounds of armor. And he's snarling like the main contender at a, you know, a main UFC event or something, you know, WWE. He is ready to go. He's, He's not scared. He's ready. And in 1 Samuel 17, 10, it says this. He said, this, this day I defy the ranks of Israel. Give me a man and let us fight each other. So he, Goliath was coming out every day, all nine foot, nine inches of him. In all that armor, he was coming out every day. I don't know, I, there was a, some intimidation that was happening there also, but nobody wanted to challenge him. You know, he came out prepared. He was ready. Nobody would take the stand. Goliath was saying to Israel, he was saying to them, give me your best shot. Give me your best man. Give me your best warrior. The odds were not stacked in David's favor. As a matter of fact, they were completely the opposite. Uh, But I believe that's the whole point of this story is that our God does the impossible things. And so when odds are not in our favor, you're in good company. Because just like David, I believe that God empowers us, gives us the strength, will, will direct us, give us the wisdom we need to face the giants that may seem so overwhelming. We see this all throughout Scripture. We see that Moses had odds against Pharaoh. Noah had odds against the flood, but he built an ark. Daniel and the lion's den, they, they, all throughout Scripture, we, stories of, we see stories of men of God, women of God who were at odds, who, who if there was an intervention on, with God on their side, that there would have been death or other things. The odds were not in their favor. And so I want to say this is that if you feel like the odds are against you, you're in good company because all throughout Scripture, that's what we see. All throughout Scripture, you see, your Goliath doesn't carry sword or shield. He brandishes blades of unemployment, abandonment, sexual abuse, depression. Your giant doesn't parade up and down the hills of Elah. He glances through your office, your bedroom, your classroom. He brings bills you can't pay, grades you can't make, people you can't please, whiskey you can't resist, things on the computer you can't refuse to look at, a career you can't escape, a past you can't shake, and a future you can't face. That's the Goliath that presents himself to us today. In other words, your Goliath doesn't have to have a cape like we see in the movies. Your Goliath doesn't have to be nine foot, nine inches tall. But always those things can seem to gravitate towards us and overtake us if we're not careful. 1 Samuel 17, 11 says this, When Saul and his men heard the Philistines' challenge, they were terrified. And I don't know about you, but there's so many moments that I've had in my life whenever I've seen what's before me, I've seen the battle that lies ahead of me, and I've been so terrified about the potential outcome. How many of you always think the worst? Like, like when, when you start to think about a situation, you think the worst, you know? Like, that's me. I, I start to look at something, and I'll, I'm always like, okay, what's the worst case scenario here? And Sarah gets so annoyed by it. She's like... Man, like you've already just decided that's what's going to happen. Don't you have a little faith, you know? And then she'll say, like, you preached it on Sunday, you know? I'm like, we don't talk about that. Don't talk about that. See, the Israelites, they were so scared. They were so terrified. No one wanted to stand up to this man. No one wanted to, to build up the courage to stand up to this man. But on that day, something was different, church. On that day, something shifted and changed. 
There was this little man who said, even though the odds are against me, even though on paper things are not stacking up to look good for me, on this day, I'm going to take this man down and God will be given the glory. Amen? Something that really stood out to me about David concerning the battle was his focus. And he was so determined. But David said, on this day, I will take down this man. And God will be given the glory. I think God's looking for men and women who will stand up to the giants in their life and say, you know what? Today, it ends. It's enough. Because hey, let's be real. How many of us, we say, you know what? Next week, we'll deal with it. Or next month, we'll deal with it. Or, you know, one day, I'm going to get this under control. You know, I, I know that what's the problem with that and what's so dangerous about about that is that the Bible says that we're not promised tomorrow. So some of you got things in your life that you're putting off taking care of, and yet God said, today's the day. <laughs> he, the, the, the Bible says his mercies are new every single day. The Bible says that, that, that we need to call upon him, we need to repent, be saved. There, there's things that have to be dealt with, and it's, we should not walk around with this mentality of next week, next month, next year. We need to be like David. Even though the odds may be, be against us, today's the day. There will be victory. But I like David's focus, too. And this is an aspect that I want to point out, maybe a little bit different. Number three, I want to ask you this in relation to the story and then in your personal life. Where is your focus? Where is your focus? You know your Goliath, even if your spouse doesn't know your Goliath, even if your pastor doesn't know your Goliath, even if the people around you don't know your Goliath, you recognize how he tries to come at you. You recognize what your, Goli your Goliath, how, how it shapes and forms itself in your life. You've seen that giant in your life. The question is, is he all that you see? Is, is that Goliath in your life the only thing that you see? When, when you see that hurdle, when you see that financial obstacle, when you see that addiction, are your eyes only focused on the problem and not a potential solution? You know the voice of your Goliath, you know Satan's temptation, the accuser of the brethren. Think about this for a moment, though. David saw and heard more. He refused to focus just on what everyone else was saying. Everyone else, you, can you imagine they were all saying, hey, David, and talking to other men amongst themselves. I mean, I imagine them like in this little tent somewhere and being like, hey, look, this dude's nine foot nine. None of us really got a chance. I think it's best if we stay here and we just camp out until we run out of food and, you know, God will take us home that way. You know, we don't have to go out there to Godzilla. Let's just stay here, you know trying to talk to themselves and, and, and justify different things. But, but David was like, something was different about him. His focus was different. David saw and heard more. David's first discussion, although it was about Goliath, it was on the Lord. Listen to this in 1 Samuel 17, 26. He says, David says this, he says, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he defied the armies of the living God? Everyone else was focused on how big the man was. Everyone else was focused on how huge this dude was and how intimidating he was. David said, who is it that's defying my Lord? Who is it that's trying to say that, that, that they can take me when I've got the God on my side, the creator of the universe on my side? David's focus was different. David operated with a different mentality than so many of us do today. Are you listening? All right, four of you. See, David showed up that day discussing God. The soldiers mentioned nothing about him. The brothers never spoke his name. But David takes one step onto the stage, and when he does, he raises the subject of the fact that the living God is on their side. No one else even mentioned that. Everyone else was focused on how big, focused on the characteristics, focused on what the task at hand. And David did what nobody else did. He brought up the fact that the living God, the God of the universe, was on their side. He does the same thing with King Saul. No chit-chat about the battle or questions about the odds. 1 Samuel 17, 37, David says, The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear, he too will deliver me from the hand of the Philistine. Here's what I want you to understand this morning, and, and you need to take this with you. Tuck it in your heart someone, somewhere. No one else discusses God while David discusses no one else but God. 
They were so focused on their giant that they didn't bring God into the equation. Some of you have allowed the things in your life to hover over you in such a way and have such a stronghold in your life that it's the only thing you fixate your mind on. Some of you, some of you couples are in here today and you're always arguing over the same thing. You're always fighting over the same thing. Some of you are in a financial burden. Some of you, I've talked about it before and just I referenced it earlier, you're facing addictions. There's things you know in your life that the Holy Spirit's convicted you about that you need to let go. And it's the only thing you keep your eyes on is how hard it will be to let go and how big it is and how, how massive the, the, the financial burden is or how hard it will be to let that addiction go. That's all we think about. How hard it will be to sever that relationship or work to restore that relationship. We just think about how big the mountain is. But David did the opposite. No one else cared to bring up the fact that the living God was on their side. And that's the only person David could talk about. Do you see the difference there? See, David saw what others don't, and he refused to see what others do. David sees what others don't, and he refuses to see what others do. All eyes except David's fell only on Goliath. See, David, though, was so focused on God, quite frankly, it didn't matter who his opponent was. Quite frankly, with David, it didn't matter if he was 12 foot nine. It didn't matter if he had 400 pounds of armor. It didn't matter if there was a whole army of them. It didn't matter with David. You know why? Because David knew that when God appoints you to, to attack an assignment, when God calls you and gives you those dreams, when God tells you that he's got you, when God says that I'm on your side, that I'm going to empower you, that I'm going to anoint you for this moment, when David knew that whenever God says that, whenever he knows he's got God on his side, that there was nothing in the world that he could possibly be scared of. And so that's what happened right there is David looked at Goliath and said, I ain't scared. I ain't scared. God's with me. First Samuel 17, 45 says this. Look at David's battle cry here in First Samuel 17, 45. It says, you come to me with a sword, with a spear, and with a javelin but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel. <laughs> he says, I have the armies of Israel on my side. Some of you today, you feel like you're walking into battle alone. You feel like you're walking onto the war zone. You're walking in the middle of the war zone and you, you, you're left out there by yourself. Can I tell you something? God doesn't leave you out there stranded. When you call up on him and you ask for his help and his guidance, God will always see through that he is, he, he doesn't grant us just a perfect life with no problems and no pain. But what he does say is that he will always be there to walk, whatever, walk with us through whatever we walk through. That he is our refuge and strength in those moments of need. He, he, is our, he is our mighty tower, our strong fortress, strong deliverer. We know that God is able. David knew that. David saw the armies of God, and because he does, in 1 Samuel 17, 48, the Bible says that when David realized this, he, he saw the armies of God. He didn't see what man saw with their eyes. When he saw the armies of God, it says in verse 48, it said, David hurried and run towards the army to meet the Philistines. He, he didn't wait. It says he ran towards his giant. And that's the fourth thing I want to point out today out of my 15 points. I'm kidding. The fourth thing I want to point out today is that David ran towards his giant. You might say... David knew how to get ahead of his giant. And I want to ask you, when was the last time you did the same? When was the last time that you chose that you were going to stay ahead of the game, that you were going to, you know, not wait to be attacked, you were going to run and be the attacker? How long since you ran towards your challenge? You see, we tend to retreat. And Christians in America today, we tend to retreat. We want to take a back seat. Back seat. We want to duck behind something to take cover. For, for a moment, a day, a year, we want to be complacent. We want to stay in our own lane. We want to just play it safe. And I, I just want to say this. You cannot play it safe and please God. God's a God of big dreams with big vision, and he gives us big tasks. 
And so David chose to run towards his giant. And I want to say this. You can run away from your giant, but sooner or later they will find you. Satan's not going to stop coming for you. You can run away. You can choose to not face it. You can try and look the other way. You can try and distract yourself, but Satan's going to keep on coming. He's attacking. He's attacking. He's attacking. Why? We, we talked about it a few weeks ago. He's here to still kill, destroy. And so because of that, you can run away, but sooner or later your giants will find you. I always teach that as Christians, we should not operate with a defensive mentality. In other words, we don't sit back and wait. We don't sit back and wait for the devil, the enemy, to come to us. We don't sit back and wait for our addictions to overcome us. We don't sit back and wait for our marriage to fall apart. We don't sit back and wait for, for that the, the sexual immorality in our life to consume us, for that addiction to try and break us. We don't sit back and wait. You know what we do as children of God? We say, you know what, this is a problem, and it's going to be dealt with today. How am I going to deal with it? Well, I've got the armies of the living God on my side, just like that. David said, and David, it says that immediately he ran towards Goliath to conquer him. He was ready to take him out. And some of you this morning, you've been sitting back. You've been playing defense. You've been waiting for it to come to you. And let me tell you something. If you do that, it'll win every single time. And I believe today that God is challenging that HFA and the Church of America to stand up and take control of the ball again, be on the offensive side of things, and go to battle. Don't sit back on defense. Try a different tactic. Rush towards your giant with a God-saturated soul. What I was talking about a, a minute ago just after worship, let's be prayed up and read up in the middle of the week so that when we come into the church, it's just an overflow of, of what's already begun to take place in our heart. Let's rush towards the giants that God will enable us to overcome. Giant of divorce, you're not entering my home. Giant of depression, it may take a lifetime, but you're not going to conquer me. Giant of alcohol, bigotry, child abuse, insecurity, pornography, you're going down today. How long has it been since you last loaded your sling and took a swing at the giant that's been intimidating you for years, for months? How long has it been since you've stepped back and stopped focusing on how big Goliath is and focused on how big your God is? One might read David's story and wonder what God saw in him. You know what God saw in David? God saw a willing heart. God saw a man who said, I don't care what the logistics say. You know, the problem with so many of us, too, is that we're analytically minded. We look at on paper. And if things don't add up on paper, we quit. We give up on things before it ever gets there because we look on paper and it's like, and, and, and I'm not saying that you can't be an analytical thinker, all right? We need analytical thinkers. But the problem with that is that some of us, we wait for it to make sense on paper before we take action. And remember... We talked about this last week as I was talking about faith. Faith is believing in things that we do not see. And so sometimes we got to take those steps of faith even when it don't make sense yet. You know what David did? He took the step of faith even when it didn't make sense on paper. Everyone else was probably saying, David, don't do it. David, you're going down. David, you're too small. David, you're too young. David, you're not strong enough. Look at how big Goliath is. David stared down Goliath. There were so many things about David. We could read through his life. David had his downfalls. We know the story of him and Bathsheba, and what took place there. And, but one of the things that David is regarded as, he's, he's known as the man after God's heart, God's own heart. I think that's why God chose him. He knew that David had it in him. It wasn't about the outward appearance. It was what was inside. Acts 13, 22 reminds us that God said David was a man after God's own heart. What does that look like? Well, God saw him as, as such gives hope to us all. God saw him as a man after his own heart. That means that for each of us today, so little to offer. David just need, or God just needed a willing vessel. 
we may look at David, or yeah, we may look at David's stature and say it's not good enough, it's not big enough. God just needed a heart to work with. And so I'm going to mess with your theology for just a moment, and it's going to be on the screen. Perfect souls would find David's story very disappointing because God didn't use somebody who was perfect. He didn't use somebody who was 10 foot tall. He didn't use somebody who was the most uh, perfect person in the world. I just mentioned the story of him and Bathsheba. Like, God, God didn't use somebody who had it all together. God just looked for somebody who was willing, somebody who was obedient, someone who would answer the call. Many of us are trying to wait until we're perfect before we fix things. Many of us wait till we attend church a certain amount of time, you know. See, we should find it reassuring that God used David. See, because if God can use David to conquer a giant, he can use anyone. If God can use Saul, a murderer and persecutor of Christians, to go on to write a third of the New Testament, come on, somebody, he can use you. If God can use Peter, who denied him, the Bible says Peter denied him three times. If God can use Peter to go on, and we read in the book of Acts where uh, Peter preached a message, and it was one of the greatest evangelistic days in the history of the church. It said thousands were added to the kingdom that day. If God can use those men, if God can use them, I'm telling you this morning, he can use you. Your giant doesn't stand a chance if you focus on God and his strength to fight your battle. The heart God loved was a checkered one. We need David's story. Giants lurk in our neighborhoods. There's rejection, there's failure, there's revenge, there's remorse. Giants, we must face them. Yet know this today, church, know this, men and women of God, you do not face your giants alone. The, you face your giants with the living God who is active, who is breathing, who is ready to go to battle with you. We know how the story ends. We know who's victorious in the end. So David's focus was right. Everyone else was focused on the giant. David's, David was focused on God. Today, many of you, as you leave this place in just a little bit, your giants are going to start popping up. You're going to want to go back and make those decisions you've been making. You want to go back and do those things. You want to talk how you talked. You, you're going to still be in that little mess that you're in. And it's going to seem so big. Just know this. David gave us the greatest advice. He, he just kept his eyes on God. How do I do it, Pastor? Keep your eyes on God. How do I overcome that mountain? Keep looking up. Sons and daughters of the king, keep looking up. He's with you. And the last thing this morning, and I'm going to ask the team to come up here. We have to take the giants down. This is where it all led up to this moment. But remember, there were choices that had to be made. David had to say yes. David had to realize that the odds were against him. David had to run towards his giant. David's focus had to be right. And when he did those things, the giant came tumbling down. 1 Samuel 17, 51, David ran and stood over him. He took hold of, his, hold of the Philistine sword and drew it from the scabbard. After he killed him, he cut off his head with the sword. This was so, this, this, this had to be the most awesome experience to watch. For somebody who had been waiting, those, the, the, the Israelites had been sitting back and seeing them. It's kind of like being bullied every single day, just seeing this time and time again, day after day after day. And here in this moment, David was victorious. So it was a sign of victory. It says he cut off his head. He was sealing in that moment to the Israelites. God's given us a promise. God's already said he's with us. Why are we walking in fear? See, the ultimate victory had taken place. One of the absolute biggest upsets in the history of the world took place on that day. Goliath, who was David's giant, was defeated once and for all. 
It's an incredible story. We've read about it since we were in Sunday school. We've read about it. We've heard sermons on it. One man conquered so much. Why did he do that? How did he do that? Because he was a man after God's own heart. And I'm here to tell you today as your pastor, and I just want to declare it and speak it over you this morning. I just believe with all my heart that as we walk out of here this week, God is going to give us giant moments where we, where we walk up to those giants and we're able to see victory because of the power that God gives us. Not in our own strength and ability, not in our own power, but in God's strength and ability as he anoints us, as he sends us out, as he's called us out into the workplace, into our homes, as he's appointed us for a time like this, God has called us to tackle the giants that hover over us every single day. And I just believe just as David saw victory here because his focus was on God and his heart was right, that if your heart will be pure and God seeking, God will empower you and enable, to, enable you to be victorious. I had a mentor tell me one time, this is going to be on the screens. This, the whole story can be summed up here. Focus on giants, you stumble. Focus on God, your giants tumble. Focus on giants, you stumble. Focus on God, your giants tumble. Church, I can't tell you how many times in my life I focused on my giants. Man, Sarah and I, when we first started out in ministry and we were making it on one income, and I'm telling you, every single day, every single week, we would, we would get home, we would talk about our bills. We're looking at each other. We were just starting out in ministry. We were saying, God, how are we ever going to do this? And we wanted to bring a kid into the equation, and it was wouldn't you say, Sarah, that was a, like a giant that hovered over us continually. It was like a financial Goliath. How are we going to do this? But, Lord, you've called us to serve in this way. You've called us in this role. How are we going to do this? We were young. We were in our early 20s. But God saw us through every step of the way. Listen to me, as a pastor over the years, I've seen young men set free from addiction. I've seen marriages restored. I've seen people healed. I've seen financial debt be completely wiped away. I, I've seen people stand up with a courage and a boldness that they hadn't had. And, and it's not because of a pastor or a man. It's because of a God who's able to do those things. The God of the Israelites is the God that we serve. The God who parted the sea, the God who, who, who navigated every single aspect of uh, the Israelites' journey through the wilderness, even in the moments when they didn't always listen, God saw them through to the promised land. Here's my promise to you, is that if you'll keep your eyes on God, if you'll seek to glorify him, if you'll respect him for who he is and say, you are my Lord, not just your magic genie that gets you out of a problem, but you are my Lord and my Savior. I will live my life serving you. When you choose that, there is nothing that can come against you that can take you down. There's no giant too big. There's no mountain too tall, no valley too deep that you can't overcome. Would you stand with me this morning? We're gonna dim the lights down. Lift your eyes to the one who can help you face the giants in your life. The God who made a miracle out of David. Church, he stands ready to make a miracle out of you today. Some of you in here today have listened to this message and you would say that you don't have a relationship with God in the first place. Well, today's your opportunity to get to know him. Some of you would say, you know what, pastor, my giants are too big. I've got no hope. I've given up already. Can I just tell you today, don't give up. Don't stop pressing in. Don't stop pursuing God because our eternal God, the victorious one is with you. Some of you are Feeling, you feel like you're fighting every single battle alone because you've not allowed God to come into your heart. 
Some of you feel like you're fighting every battle alone because the things that you're fighting, you're not willing to surrender. And this morning, I just believe like God's challenging us as a body to come and surrender those things. He's, he's challenging us to come and lay them down. And so I declare that today, from this point forward, may the people of HFA stand up and rise up with a boldness. May we walk as David did. May we have the courage that David did, knowing that we aren't alone, knowing that the battle is not ours to fight. May we understand that the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is on our side. The God of Moses is on our side. Jesus, the one who set people free, who healed the sick, who healed the blind, who healed the deaf, who raised from the dead, the one who multiplied the, the loaves of, of bread and, and the fish, the one who, who did all these things, who was nailed to a cross because of our sin but three days later rose again. That God who's been victorious time and time again all throughout the word of God and has been victorious in different moments of your life, I know that you've had those moments too. He is here today and he's ready to walk with you towards your giant to take back what in the enemies tried to steal from you. In the name of Jesus, joy will be restored this morning. Yes. In the name of Jesus, chains of addiction will break. Yes. In the name of Jesus, mountains will become hills. In the name of Jesus, those oceans will part once again in your life and you'll see the mercy of God, the, the, the God in all of his glory begin to manifest himself in your life. I'm going to ask the prayer teams if they would come down this morning. We're going to do two things today. The first thing is this. If you're in this place and you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, in just a moment, the worship team's going to start playing just softly for a minute. And as they do, if you don't have a relationship with Jesus, I want you to get out of your chair and I want you to come down here. Let, let me tell you something. We don't look at you condemning you. The Bible says that it's a day of celebration whenever one person gives their life to Christ. It, it's, it's a moment that is forever stamped in your life as the greatest day that you ever had. For some of you, you're going to come back to Jesus today for the first time. Sorry, you're going to come to Jesus for the first time or you're going to come back to him because you've been running and you've been living life your own way. And the second thing is some of you got some giants in your life that seem too big and you've been running backwards. You've been trying to, trying to run away from them. It's like a game of hide and seek. You've been trying to hide, waiting for him to come to find you, waiting for that giant to come find you. And today I just believe with everything in me that God's asking us to take victory. He's asking us to take it back. He's asking us to walk forward, to move forward, to stand up and claim what's rightly ours by the power of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you guys for joining us for this week's service. If you asked Jesus to come into your heart or you rededicated your life, we want to know about it. So stay connected with us on our website. You'll see it below the screen. You'll go to connect. You'll go to prayer request, whatever it is that you need. We want to stay connected with you. Fill out the connect card with all your information. We promise not to blow up your, your email with a junk mail or anything like that or call you or send you out mass text. We just want to know your information in case you need us. Um, we are here for you. So we can't wait to see you guys next week. Please join us.